Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to Manav Visual Smart Samiti's event on free Libre software. I want to begin by thanking our partners, Internet Freedom Foundation and Free Software Foundation of India for making this event a reality. Today is an exciting day as we will be having a lot of great conversations with our speakers. Let me quickly begin by introducing you our first speaker for today. She is a wonderful woman from Internet Freedom Foundation. She is the organizational and community manager at Internet Freedom Foundation. She heads the operation and community building and uh, outreach program for IFF. Please welcome Ms. Shivani Singh. Moving on to our second speaker for today. He is a hacker, entrepreneur, and a free software advocate. He is a member of Free Software Foundation India Working Group. Please welcome Mr. Abbas Abhinav. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Let me just uh, switch the uh, presentation. Right. So the conversation that we would be having today is about free and libre software. And the question I would want to answer is why uh, freedom matters in technology and how it can help, how choices that we make can help us choose a free life. So I, from what I understand, uh, most of you are students and uh, you are from various some of you are studying law some of you are studying science uh, and i guess there are some people who are studying engineering as well and uh, so i don't intend to make this a very technical uh, presentation the, uh, the, the the presentation is intended to uh, center more around the ideology and uh, of the free software movement and uh, well, I'm talking on behalf of the Free Software Foundation of India. We are a non-profit and uh, we are about uh, 18 years or 19 years old. Uh, and well, broadly, the goal of Free Software Foundation of India is to help create a society where, which is powered by free software and which will then lead to the creation of a free society, society where we are in control and we, we have the freedom to do uh, you know, what we want to do. So uh, before we sort of launch into that, uh, I have some questions. Now, I don't know if you want to answer them verbally here, but at least I want you to think about these answers because uh, these answers would uh, relate to our discussion today. And uh, the, the first, uh, so the broad question that I'm sort of asking you is, what sort of world uh, do you imagine uh, for yourself? Uh, what is the world in which you want to live in? And uh, uh, most of you uh, might be very young, so this is also a very apt question to ask. Uh, how much power do you possess in your lives? And of course, this is a very this is not a very specific question. It's very vague. But think about power to make choices. Think about power to do what you want to do. Think about the freedom to explore, the power to exercise the freedom that you have, right? So, so consider these questions. Uh, how much power do you possess? Uh, do you wish? Uh, do you wish to choose what is private to you? And that is not a very simple. I mean, that's a very large discussion in itself. But uh, who defines what is private to you and what is not? How do you choose uh, to uh, have privacy if you want? Uh, who defines what privacy means? Is it you who defines it? Is it someone else? Uh, who makes a determination? Who gives them what gives them the power to make that it's a determination on your behalf for example uh, who controls what you can learn and how you can learn that uh, and uh, then if you are able to learn something uh, what what happens are you free to use your skills and creations and your knowledge for whatever you think you want to employ it for or does somebody else still retain the power to exert some constraints on that Right. So all these things that I'm talking about, in a way, they, they have an impact on what world we're going to live in. And it's up to us to choose, you know, what what sort of world that is. Similarly, what are the terms under which you get access to knowledge? Now, knowledge, the word knowledge is I, I use that in a very uh, broad sense, uh, learning some learning a subject uh, as a part of your academics is knowledge as well. Uh, having the source code to a program is also knowledge is, is also a form of knowledge. So the question is, under what terms do you get access to knowledge? Uh, 
do you have to show a ticket to get access to it or uh, do you have to be from a certain place to get access to it or do you have to be a certain age to get access to it or are there any other arbitrary constraints uh, under which you get access to a certain knowledge so think think about that uh, do you think that these terms are fair who define these terms uh, do you accept these terms and if you don't uh, what are you going to do about it uh, finally uh, do you always ex accept things the way they work do you if you, you might have a gadget you might have a computer you might have uh, you know you, you might be visiting and using software all over the internet uh, they work in a specific way uh, is that always acceptable to you if it is not acceptable to you what is it that you want to fix or do you want to fix it or do you even think that you have the power to fix uh, something right so these are very broad questions like i said but uh, the road that they lead us to is 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 the topic of our uh, discussion today so basically if you look at if if you answer these questions uh, you know in your own minds there are a few things which would then be the pillars of uh, of the world that we are trying to imagine the uh, the the world where you have the means you have the uh you have the opportunity to do things you have the tools available to you you have knowledge you have knowledge which is accessible which enables you to use these tools and these means and this opportunity to create skills and that then give makes you a part of a very large community uh where you can uh, participate in and you can you can sort of contribute to that community and also draw from it so free and libre software is a framework like that it's a value system it's an ideology and i'm going to define it uh, you know so we have chosen these words very carefully here and i'll also tell you which words i've chosen not to use and why these words matter uh, in themselves so the idea is to define a, a framework which gives you the means the opportunity the tools the skills the knowledge the and the community and hence the freedom to do all that you want to do uh, for yourself okay so uh, so what is uh, free software well free software is software which gives you freedom now and uh, what freedoms are we talking about very broadly we're talking about four types of freedoms uh, freedom to use a piece of software for any purpose and that's a very simple statement it does not need any qualification which means that if i have to further you know you know go into details about it i would say you can use a software for a business you can use it in a non profit you can use it as a student you can use it as a professional you can use it in in india you can use it in just about any country you can use it in space right so so software which so free when we use the word free software the word free uh, is there to indicate freedom and basically we're talking about uh, software which provides freedom to you as a basic facet of that software so uh, so the freedom to use that software for any purpose is the first uh, is the first freedom that the software would give you the second uh, freedom that you would get from free software is the freedom to study how the software works now how do you understand how do you study how software works well you need access to the source code of that software right so access to the source code of the software is the second freedom that you always have it's a it's an it's a right that you always have uh, with with the software which is now you are able to see this tool that we using for video conferencing and let's say you are curious to understand how conferencing works how does a video stream from my end get transmitted to you how does it get relayed over the internet how is it that a pdf presentation that i uploaded is now showing up in all your computers uh, how is my audio getting transmitted for example if you had questions like this uh, of course you could ask people you could read uh, books about it you could read documentation about it but you could also read source code about it and that is an excellent way uh, to learn something so free software would also would always ship with its source code and would give you the opportunity to study that source code uh, what happens when you have access to the source code you can also modify the source code right so what does modification mean well source code is a recipe right so you have ingredients the compiler your source code your computer you know those are the ingredients you use source code to combine these ingredients in a specific way and the output is a program right now 
typically when you're trying to learn something, one of the simplest things you do is that you change the way you do it uh, a little bit. So if I was trying to learn cooking uh, and I have a recipe with me, uh, and I want to understand why that recipe is structured in a certain way, what is the importance of each of those ingredients, I might want to tweak those ingredients a little bit. I'll put, maybe I'll replace one of them or I'll change some one of them, I'll, I'll increase their quantity or decrease their quantity or change the order in which they are put into the, uh, into the dish. And when I, when I make those changes, maybe the outcome would be different or maybe maybe it would be better than what I expected, maybe it would be worse off. But either way, I'm understanding, I'm able to understand the recipe much better, isn't it? So make so tweaking that recipe is an integral part of being able to understand how cooking works. Similarly, when you have access to the source code, being able to change that source code uh, is an excellent way to learn how that program works. And then if you want to, if you want to affect the behavior of the program, you want to change it, you want to fix a behavior, or you want, you just want the program to do something else, uh, then for doing all those things also, you would need access to the source code, right? So that is a, a right and a freedom that you get with software, which is distributed as, uh, or labeled as uh, a free software. And finally, you get the freedom to redistribute the software, uh, not just in its original form, but also in its modified form, which again means that uh, that if I if I take this program that we're using for uh, for streaming this uh, uh, discussion, uh, and if you wanted to make some change to it, let's say you don't like this dark blue color, you want to make it something else, or uh, you know you want to add some features to it and so on, you could do that, and you could share your modified version with everyone. Uh, you could not you you would not just be you, you would not just be able to share the original version that you got from someone else but also the modified version right so so these are the things and you know a lot of times we are taught uh, in you know we see advertisements in media that copying software is bad well of course copying all the software is not bad uh, there is software which is distributed with the explicit permission that you should copy it and that is what free software is you are explicitly allowed to copy it and not just copy it but also change a, a copy of that software uh, and redistribute the changed copy so don't let someone tell you that uh, it's illegal to change software or to to try to crack it or change its source code and you know all those things uh, it's not uh, specifically when that software ships with this freedom as a part of it right and these freedoms are available to everyone uh, these are not just a domain of a No, there is no barrier which says only certain people have access to these freedoms. Uh, of course, uh, like I was saying earlier, the precondition to all these uh, all these uh, freedoms uh, is uh, uh, source code. So unless you have source code, you cannot uh, uh, you you cannot do. You really can't use this freedom much. Uh, the, the source code is very essential. Now, well. In English, uh, the word free has multiple meanings. And uh, so sometimes when we use the word free software, people think it's software that is available free of charge. That might be the case, but that's not a necessary condition for the software to be called free software. Uh, the, the true distinction is between gratis and libre. And we're talking to the to the liberty. We're talking about the freedom. We're not talking about the price of the software. Of course, if you could, if anyone could copy the software, if everyone is allowed to copy the software, the software could very well be available free of charge. But that's not a part of the definition of why it's called free software, which is why this the, the topic of the session is free slash libre software, because the word libre then con, you know conveys the, the, the essential meaning of the freedom that we're talking about. And people would people when they hear that term wouldn't think that. Uh, we're talking about software which is available free of charge. Software which is available free of charge may or may not provide these freedoms and rights to you. And that is what is uh, essential to uh, understand. Now, a lot of times you would have heard a term called open source software in media. Uh, you would have heard it on the internet. Uh, you would have seen it in movies or even read it in, in newspapers. And again, the reason I'm drawing a distinction between what is uh, a free or libre software and open source software is that the definite i mean the, the, the definition is not just in the wording it is it is about uh, you know it's 
I can go into some history about it, but uh, what I have on screen for you is the free software definition, which are these four freedoms which I talked about, and the, the, the open source definition, which has 10, uh, uh, 10 uh, sort of rules uh, as, a, as a part of it. And uh, essentially what both of these talk about is the same thing. They just talk about it in different ways. Uh, so there is a difference. The difference between free and libre software and open source software is about the focus. Uh, when we talk about free software, we, we try to bring the discussion back to philosophy. We, we talk about the ideology, we talk about freedom. And, and of course, these are very abstract uh, uh, concepts sometimes. Uh, these require discussion, these require explanation. Uh, open source, the open source movement also typically focuses on the practical benefits of using such software or its advantages or the fact that it's available uh, free of charge uh, and, and things like that. Uh, so while they're essentially talking about the same thing and, and even though the open source definition and the free software definition also talk about the same value systems, uh, they, they, they talk about it from different perspectives. And the reason we feel that the term free software is more representative is because it, it, it encourages people to think about the community and the movement. And uh, the term open source does not uh, uh, sort of bring that attention and focus on, on those things. And uh, today, in fact, uh, the word open source has been misappropriated to mean all sorts of things which don't even fit the free software definition of the open, so open source definition. And, that is another reason to sort of not use that term because it doesn't really mean anything. It could even refer to software which is not distributed with source code. It could even refer to software uh, which doesn't allow you to make changes to it or copy it and, and things like that. So, well, by definition, that software is not open source or free software. And then when people use that as a sort of a marketing term to, to, to you know, sell that software or to get it into people's hands, uh, that's wrong. Uh, and hence, we should be very uh, accurate in the terms we use when we talk about uh, uh, such things. So the free software movement is not a new phenomenon. It started in the early 80s. Uh, Dr. Richard Stallman started the Free Software Foundation. He founded the GNU project to create an entirely free operating system. And all these years, the, the goal was very singular. Uh, I should be able to do everything using free software all the time. Uh, of course, there are reasons why these, this is, uh, there are reasons I would consider obvious, uh, we will come to those, but that was a very, very simple goal that the, the movement started with. Uh, lots of people, thousands and thousands of people from all over the world have contributed to building this software and releasing it and supporting it and adding value to it over these years. And which is why uh, we can do all these wonderful things that we can do today. So this is what we were working towards as a community. Uh, but where has it got us? Uh, I'm trying to summarize the state of our software, hardware, internet ecosystem here. And what I want to draw upon is one extreme. And I want to then take you back and explain how to sort of free yourself, because that is also the underlying theme for our discussion today. Uh, so what do we have? We have mobile phones, uh, which have uh, become uh, portable tracking devices. They have proprietary software in them. We can't control that software. We don't have access to the source code of that software. And hence, uh, that software basically enslaves us. It doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't we, we can't control it. Uh, so something we can't control then you know, enslaves us in that way. And uh, then someone who controls that software also controls us because uh, we are not in control and we don't have source code and or even if we had source code we couldn't modify it or put that source code back into our phones those who control the source code of the software which runs in our phone then indirectly control us right so that is one uh, one of the uh, extremes where we are right now we have websites which are javascript heavy uh, these use client side software uh, so javascript is software which runs in your browser a lot of times uh, there are various technical reasons to build websites like that or web applications like that. But essentially, then people are running software on your computer without your permission. And a lot of times that software is proprietary in nature. So now, you know, even though you might want to use only free software and you might, you might want to be in complete control of things, 
uh, you are having to use proprietary software because that's how most of these websites work. Uh, then we have social networking, which is basically our data, data that we post on those websites, which is then used to track what we like, what we don't like, what we view, at what times of the day we view it, uh, what device we use to view it, uh, maybe which network we are when we view it, and so on. And then there are techniques uh, that can you that can be used to create influence. So if the feed in feed in which I consume uh, news uh, it, it, it can be it can be uh, customized uh, to to fit my uh, likes, uh, then I can be influenced. And basically, social networks have become a, a manner of also influencing people because of uh, the way they can track us and get access to our data. Uh, you would have heard this term called SaaS, software as a substitute. Uh, in the free software community, there is another term that we use to represent the, this class of software, which is service as software substitute. Basically, someone is providing a service to you instead of software and as a substitute to software. But either way, uh, this domain of software is software where we don't have control over our data. Basically, data is stored on somebody else's computer. You don't have access to the software because the software is also running on somebody else's computer. And then there are contracts which may or may not be fair, but which you are, which you are forced to agree to as a precondition to using that software. So no data, no software, and contracts which you don't have the ability to influence or, or negotiate. Uh, so that is another thing. Uh, then we also have a lot of so-called smart hardware. Uh, basically, these are black boxes that you, you can't see what's happening inside it. They are powered by software that you can't usually control or change or access or fix. Uh, it's very difficult to repair such hardware. In those software ecosystems is because uh, it is via such, uh, uh, such hardware. So that's another thing. And then finally, there is proprietary firmware. Uh, this is a little technical term. Uh, but there is a lot of firmware. There is a lot of software which runs in very small devices, all types of devices. And uh, it's very invisible. We have no control on that. But that is a way that we can be attacked and our privacy can be uh, violated. So this is where we have reached after more than uh, 35 years of building, a, trying to build a free society. Uh, but that's I'm, I'm not trying to say that things are bad. I'm just trying to say that there is a way we can regain and retain our freedom and live a free life. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you have to do it at every level. Uh, mobile phones, which are fully free, uh, they might not be very functional. They might not. They might require you to not use certain applications because those applications are proprietary and they spy on you. Uh, but in a limited way, that is possible. Uh, depending upon your appetite for risk or appetite for experiments, you could be completely free, partially free, or you know not have a free uh, a phone at all. But these are these what I've outlined here are ways in which you can do these things. Uh, these the, the methods might not be perfect; they might lead to certain inconvenience. Uh, but then you have to remind yourself why you even chose to make those decisions. Uh, so federated software, uh, MUSS is on uh, Mastodon. And Mastodon is, an, is a prime example of software which is federated, basically, which is not run at the center of the internet. Uh, email is another wonderful example of federated uh, protocols and federated software. Uh, it's one of the oldest, in fact. Uh, everyone doesn't need to have an email account on the same server or the same with, with the same company uh, to be able to, right? So it should be the same thing for every other messaging system and uh, uh, communication system as well. So when you host the software on your own, uh, preferably with, uh, free, with free software, you get to own your data, and you can exit tracking that third parties can do onto you. Similarly, on uh, for our hardware. I mean, so I'm not going into much detail here, but we can, if you're curious about how you could uh, choose hardware, which uh, then leads to uh, living with more freedom, then you know, we, can, we can go into that. So what are these obvious reasons that I mentioned? Why is it that we want to uh, choose uh, free software at all? Well, 
some way or the other, we are all learners. We are, we are students. We are doing. We are learning things all the time. And uh, free software provides excellent learning opportunities to us. If you wanted to understand how everything in the world around you, how everything works, how if you wanted to figure that out, you would need to have access to the source code and the knowledge of all those things. And well, free software is a way to do that. Uh, free software doesn't impose any constraints on binaries or what you can attempt or achieve, which means that if you have a computer and an internet connection, you have the same resources that I have, that millions of other people have to do all these wonderful things. You're, you're not limited by resources then, not by access to knowledge, access to software, access to tools, access to learning skills, access to communities. You don't have those uh, constraints. You are free to access those things and then use them in whichever way they work for you. Uh, control over data is a natural side effect of choosing free software. Uh, who gets to determine how your data is used? Well, you should be the people uh, who, who, who make that choice. Uh, why isn't everything repairable? Well, uh, everything doesn't have source code. And uh, so free software is repairable because it ships with source code. And also the opportunity to understand that source code and uh, modify it and you know deploy it again. Uh, more importantly, free software enables us to be a part of a community uh, it, where we are equal stakeholders in a way, where we can help others, we can teach others, we can also learn from others, we can service them, we can do things that they don't want to do, and they can do things that we don't want to do. So it creates interdependence among you know people who are there as a part of the community. So so these are some very good reasons to choose. Uh, this is a bit more of that in the same way. So well, why is free software not so popular? Uh, you might, if you if you read uh, news on the internet or if you visit various uh, you know, social media websites and so on, it's not common that you would see a hashtag which says free software. Or uh, you might see open source a lot, but you might not see uh, the term free software a lot. And uh, uh, that's just about awareness. I feel people, a lot of people have a problem with the word free. A lot of people do understand what the word free means as well, but uh, then you would have to go about explaining the ideology, or maybe it sounds too idealistic to imagine that we all want to have or should have freedom. So, well, I, I can't uh, speculate on you know why everyone would not choose to use the term free software. Yes, the word free can be interpreted in many ways, and but but I think uh, it's up to us to uh, to choose what term to use and. Uh, to, to take a stand as well. If you can understand and appreciate the, the value systems which drive this community and the movement, and you feel that these provide uh, the, the right context in which you want to live your lives, then I would, I would suggest that you uh, take a stand. And uh, using the word free software, understanding it, uh, it's not just about the words we use, of course. It's also about understanding it and making that value system a part of our lives. So choose terms for the right reasons. Don't just use the term open source because it's popular. I don't use it uh, because I don't know what the other person will understand when I use that word. And hence, in the interest of being accurate with what I say, with my message, I would want to use the word free software. Yes, even that can be misinterpreted. Uh, but then I always try to qualify uh, what I'm trying to say uh, when I use that term. A uh, lot of times people are uncomfortable when they're talking about our rights as users of software or technology. Uh, we don't want to get into the politics of technology. Well, this is about that politics of technology, about the philosophy, about the ideology which drives such software movements and the technology that runs our lives. Uh, there is no way to escape that. And uh, uh, if, if it's only through ideology that we can sustain the movement, uh, the way to sustain movement is not through technology or just just talking about technology. Uh, the ideology is what sustains us. Uh, personally, I have been using uh, GNU Linux uh, for about 22 years. And initially, what was attractive to me was technology, I admit that. But then when I understood the philosophy of GNU and the GNU project, and uh, in a way that created the context with which I could uh, stay with this movement uh, all my life. Uh, so I don't see myself doing anything else. Uh, and I was probably your age when I started using uh, 
uh, free software when I was in college. So don't be uncomfortable talking about your rights. Uh, these these rights and these freedoms matter no matter what role you play. Uh, I run a business and I still think these are extremely, extremely important values to focus on just because you're an entrepreneur or you're an activist or you're a developer or just a user. Uh, there is always a way to uh, contextualize these value systems. So I'll give you a small glimpse of the licensing framework uh, before I end so that you understand how these freedoms are codified in a manner that they can be applied by everyone. So what is a license? Uh, well, a license, uh, when, you, when you have a driving license, it gives you the right to drive, right? So and it also encompasses certain duties that you have as a driver on the road and certain rights that you have as a driver on the road. So well. Software licenses also uh, uh, define these rights that you have as a, as a user of that software and also what you owe the community or the developers when you use or modify that software. So that is the context in which we use the word license. And if you read the uh, GNU manifesto and you read some of the history of, the, of how the free software license framework uh, came into uh, place, the one of the first things that uh, the the uh, GNU GPL mentions is that unlike other uh, unlike other licenses which are designed to take your freedom away, freedom to use or do various things with software away, uh, the GNU GPL actually wants to give those freedoms to you and you know sort of embody them in that license. So this is very unlike. So now the license is a legal document, yes, but it also has in its preface uh, uh, an advocacy element. Because that is the, the, the legal framework is to protect us and to permit us to do all these things. But that is not the reason it was built. It was built to clarify uh, how you know, people should do things. So it's a technolegal framework. And there are broadly two types of uh, licenses that are protective and non-protective. And uh, you might hear uh, multiple ways of looking at this distinction, but I will you know, illustrate this in a very simple manner. There are licenses which we call copyleft licenses. Uh, which are protective. They're protective in the sense they protect freedom and they don't let anybody uh, sort of uh, compromise on, on the freedom aspect of that software. So, so that is one type of licenses, copyleft licenses or protective licenses. And there are these licenses are also reciprocal in nature. So if I have got a piece of software for you from you uh, under a copyleft license and I make changes to it or I redistribute it, I have to reciprocate the same freedom that I got from you. So my users or subsequent users of the program would have as much freedom as I had and you have, right? So that is what it means by the reciprocal aspect of freedom. Permissive licenses are, of course, simpler, but they are they, they, they have a very important facet in the sense that they allow you to make the program's source code proprietary. Proprietary means uh, your users don't have a right or the opportunity to access the program's uh, source code. So uh, permissive licenses are also fairly, I mean, very popular in fact. But these are two types of licenses uh, that are there. Now, what are these licenses? Uh, so uh, this is a small illustration of these licenses. Uh, uh, we're not going to go very deep into it. Uh, if you're interested, you know, we can discuss it later on or at the end. But as you go towards this side, you basically move from, from proprietary and permissive licenses to licenses which continue to guarantee uh, uh, freedom to you and which will make sure that they are reciprocated. So these are, uh, th these are the copyleft licenses, most all of these. Uh, these are the licenses which uh, allow you to make changes and uh, further versions of that software uh, proprietary. So well, a lot of this uh, would would lead me to a more more sort of technological discussion about licenses. I'm I'm going to skip that, and in case you want to understand more about licenses, uh, we can we can discuss that uh, at the end. Right. So, so now you know if the, one of the questions you are looking at answering today is how do you live a free life? Uh, I'm going to give you a small snapshot of that. Uh, another maybe five minutes. And the way you start doing that is by auditing your software, hardware, and service usage. Now, you know, we, we don't always have a very clear uh, 
decision making framework when we choose to use a piece of hardware or a software or a service uh, we use it because it's popular a lot of time we get pulled in by our family and friends or our school or workplace a lot of times uh, we take something which is popular and accessible right so what are we, what am i talking about i'm talking about operating systems uh, you all have computers and mobile phones you're running an operating system on it uh, how do you choose what that operating system is? Uh, we are a, we, we become a part of computer networks, wireless networks, or mobile networks. Uh, which networks? Uh, how do you choose which networks you want to be a part of? How do you use email? Uh, how what tools you use to build documents or to share documents? Uh, how do you synchronize files and contacts and messages from your phone to your laptop and elsewhere? Uh, how do you communicate with people over you know? voice or text, uh, what browser do you use? How do you access your music or your eBooks or your, uh, how do you do your shopping? How do you, so, so well, there are tools, uh, you know, in, in all possible ways. The, the point I'm asking for is to reflect and be mindful of the choices that went into selecting those tools. Uh, Consider these points. If you are using uh, a microblogging software, or if you are using a specific software to to chat with others or make calls with others, where is that software hosted? Uh, where does the data that the software operates on? Uh, where does that data reside? Do you have the source code for the entire service? Which means that do you have the source code to the software that runs on the service provider's computer, or do you have access to the source code of the program which runs on your computer or your phone. Uh, if you are consuming a service, for example, an email service, uh, well, how much uh, how much access does that service provider have to your data? Uh, can the data be encrypted at rest? At rest means when the data is stored on somebody else's computer, is it encrypted there? Does the service provider get to have complete access to all your emails or all your chat, for example? What about uh, data in transit? When it is going from my phone to your phone or my computer to your computer, is that encrypted? Who can get access to that data while it is in transit? So, so look at all these tools that, that are listed. These are just some of them, of course. We use a lot more, maybe. But look at all these things and introspect on these aspects of it. And then try to figure out um, you know, what is happening to your programs and data, but also uh, consider what it took to make those decisions. Uh, maybe some of those were de facto dis decisions. Some of them were out of pressure. You know, you will not be allowed to attend a course if you did not use a piece of software. Now, that's very unfair, but that is also a reason how we get pulled into various things. Now, what if this uh, this discussion that we're doing here uh, was being done with a proprietary system, and uh, you didn't have an opinion if you chose to use that piece of uh, that proprietary system or not. But then I would be propagating and endorsing the system if I used it. So you get pulled into using proprietary software or software which doesn't respect you broadly uh, because of choices others make. And then when you want to participate in their decision making, you know, you get. So we're not always making these choices mindfully. So again, if you wanted to change the tools that you're using, if you wanted to change how you use software, how you use hardware and, and computers and networks, uh, there are uh, I would classify our choices into three parts. One is only use free software, completely self-host all the services that you depend on yourself, which is email, chat. It could be the way you share file, the way you back up your let's say a phone or your laptop. You know all those things. Do all those things yourself. Now you might not know how to do it. You might not know where to get started, but uh, the, the thing that you do have is the freedom to do those things. Uh, and how to get started and how to do those things, uh, I would personally love to help you out. And there are so many other people in the community uh, who would also love to help you out. So if you are ready to, to make that choice, uh, you will find people who will uh, help you out. Uh, that much uh, confidence I have. Another way of making choices is, uh, use only use free software clients, but you could mix a proprietary and self-hosted services, which means that let's say you're using an email service, which is outside your control, but at least you're accessing that service from a mail client that is licensed as free software, right? So now that's a middle ground. 
uh, that is a middle ground. At least the male client respects you. Maybe the service does or does not. We, we can't know that. But at least the male client uh, respects you. And uh, that would be better than the male client and the male server, both of them not respecting you, right? So everything else is that aspect where we don't basically think on. So these are three things. Uh, you, we might, some of us might be here. From here, we move here, and then we could move here. Uh, there is, this is not just a place you end up with. Uh, it's a process, and it's a tough fight. If making this choice meant you can't use a particular uh, communication system which lets you stay in touch with your family, then that's a tough choice to make. But then it depends on whether you can get everyone in your family also to shift over, right? So that is. It's not easy to do that. And it's not just that if you do it, that is sufficient. We have to then also help others make uh, uh, similar uh, choices as well. So uh, like I said, uh, think about what is it that stops you. If you feel that some of these arguments that I've tried to give you today are convincing, uh, and there is still something that stops you, I would personally love to hear about it. And then maybe I, I would try to work harder or make a better pitch to encourage you to shift to free software and self-hosted services. Uh, there is actually a work plan I can sell. Uh, I, I can share with you how you can gradually do that. But that is that is something. So to summarize uh, what our discussion today was about, uh, freedom does matter. And one way of choosing to have freedom and to live freely is to choose free software for every aspect of technology. And well, the creation of a free society then depends upon each of us making this choice of using free software and having freedom in every as aspect of our lives. Right? So that's what I had to share with you by Richard Feynman. Uh, he said, what I cannot create, what I, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And know how to solve every problem that has been solved. So I think this is a very good template and starting point as well on your journey to use uh, uh, free software and live a free life. Right? So uh, we can probably have uh, questions at the end of the session after uh, Shivani has also talked about it. Thank you so much. And uh, now Ms. Shivani Singh can join. She would like to share her experience with free and open source software. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad you could make it on a Saturday. Uh, I'm Shivani, and I head operations and community at the Internet Freedom Foundation. I'll just quickly begin by telling you a little bit about the work we do uh, and why we are slowly shifting to um, free software that we can host on, on our own, etc. Um, so IFF is an Indian digital liberties organization that seeks to ensure technology respects fundamental rights. We were born out of the Save the Internet movement for net neutrality in 2016. And um, we became a fully staffed organization towards the end of 2018. Um, our focus uh, is to bring about institutional change by work working closely with government institutions. And we work towards the issues of internet shutdowns, privacy and surveillance, free speech, and online censorship, net neutrality, innovation, etc. Since we began as a volunteer-led organization, community has always been one of the central elements for the work that we do. So before the pandemic, before COVID-19 happened, we regularly organized um, events to keep in touch with them. Um, but since we moved towards remote work and since we were all confined to our homes, uh, one of the challenges that we faced was keeping in touch with the community. And, and, and that's when we started thinking about organizing digital events. Um, one of the first major challenges we also faced was the technical tools that we needed to do something like this. And using something like Zoom was never really an option for us uh, because it doesn't exactly have a very good track record when it comes to online security of its participants. Um, and naturally, also because of the kind of the work that we do. You can't work on on privacy uh, and you know free speech and surveillance if you're using tools like Zoom, um, and and so we thought about implementing or hosting you know Big Blue Button or Jitsi on our own instance, but that also wasn't as straightforward because we don't have the capacity for it, right? Um, 
So somewhere around Seb, we had also launched the Internet Freedom Forum to bring the digital rights community in India in one place so they could seek help and learn from each other and talk about and share their interests. Um, when we were trying to figure these things out, I just reached out to the community there uh, and asked if you know they had any tools in mind that were privacy respecting, quote unquote, and that, that we could implement for our own online events. And that was precisely when Abhas got in touch with us and offered to help us set our own big blue button instance and even run it for us. Um, now, big blue button is also a fairly new interface for most people, myself included. So it definitely took us a while to um, get used to the system. Um, and 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 there are but there are things that you can do to make the experience easy for yourself and for the others that are joining the calls. For example, one one of the things that I do now when we host uh, our events on Big Blue Button is just sending a list of instructions to whoever is joining the call or your webinar, so they don't have to go through too much trouble and they can join with the right means. Um, and I think one of the best things about using free software. Uh, is and and it's something that Abbas mentioned to me was that you can fix things, right? So if there are bug fixes you have, you have the ability to fix them on your own, and you might not necessarily always know how to go about doing it, which is also why you can reach out to people and ask for help. Um, being a part of you know various communities is particularly helpful for things like this, um, and and I'm not going to say that it's it's super easy to transition to you know open source tools or or extremely convenient either. But it's not impossible or wildly difficult. And I think now that we're going to be working like this, we are going to be working towards a digital world um, for the foreseeable future, right? Because of the pandemic and a lot of other factors as well. Um, it's it's a good it's a good it's a good thing to transition transition earlier than later. Also because it's a good skill to have. It's I think it's a life skill to 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 know and understand these things a little bit and to be a part of these communities. Um, and 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 it's largely helpful. Keep yourself and your devices secure, right? With all the things that you're sharing now and and the world that you're in. Um, so if you feel at a loss at understanding some of these things, and I know that one session is probably not enough to get you going. But if you do have questions, you can reach out to Abhas or me. In fact, because I understand they can be complex and overwhelming at first to understand. Um, you can also just reach out to to uh, people at the Internet Freedom Forum where I, I mean, reached out to them. And there are a lot of people there who are very willing to help. I will put the link on the chat box here as well, so it's easier for you. Um, so I hope this session was at least like a small step for you towards, you know, adopting more free and open source tools uh, that are safer um, and and more quote unquote ethical for lack of a better word. Um, I will stop at that and I'll hand it back to uh, Jessica and or Lubna from MUSS. Thanks for joining us. If you have more questions, uh, please feel free to ask them now or later as they come to you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shivani. Mr. Abhas, there is a question in the public chat box. Mr. And who or Adiri would like to know if uh, he can create a soft free software from taking source code from other free softwares? Uh, yes, that is something you're actively uh, allowed to do and you're encouraged to do. And uh, uh, so, well, it also doesn't mean that if you use a piece of free software to do something, you are forced to release your changes to that. Uh, let me sort of add to that uh, at the end of it. But, Yes, you could, uh, you know, you want to send out uh, emails or run a newsletter. Uh, you could uh, write a program. There are several such uh, programs and tools available freely. You could use one of those. You could also change them, uh, fix them, extend them to your liking. And uh, based on uh, whatever sort of those changes were meaningful to you, uh, why not? So a lot of tools that you are using that you might be using right now uh, are actually free software tools. Uh, like Firefox is a free software tool, and uh, LibreOffice is a free software tool. Uh, these are excellent tools to browse the internet, to 
uh, edit documents, presentations, spreadsheets, and so on. Uh, if you were looking at a distributed uh, messaging tool, uh, Matrix, Riot, these are these are that's a, that's an excellent uh, uh, platform. It's federated, uh, so there is no one company which runs or owns that network, which allows you to communicate with others. So that's an ex that's also uh, an excellent tool uh, to use. Of course, you could run your own mail server. So how many of you have heard of a small computer called the Raspberry Pi? Some of you have heard of it. So you could run a lot of services at home on just that sort of computer. You don't need a very costly computer. You don't need a server. You don't need anything else. You could just use something as simple and cost effective as a Raspberry Pi to run services for yourself at home or uh, at your college or in your hostel or uh, any other place like that. Yeah, so any other questions? Uh, Mr. Abbas, I don't think anybody else has any questions. So should we end this session? All right. Uh, you have uh, Shivani's contact as well as mine. And there is also this. Uh, th there's also the forum that the Internet Freedom Foundation runs. So it's, a, it's an excellent forum to be in touch with activists and uh, technologists alike. Uh, there are also various other mailing lists and forums uh, uh, in India which cater to the larger free software community, fsci.in, free software community of India. fsci.in is one such a good starting point. Uh, if you want to volunteer with the movement, there are opportunities for doing uh, that as well. Yes. Right. So thank you, Jaskaran. It was an excellent uh, opportunity to share details about uh, free software. And uh, look, look forward to uh, helping sustain this uh, movement and choice uh, towards Freedom respecting software. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jasper, and it was lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would I would like to thank Mr. Abbas and Ms. Shivani and uh, everyone else who joined. And I would also like to thank Internet Freedom Foundation and Free Software Foundation of India. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining in.